every morning at 7 a.m. Uh, a different group of us gathers. Usually it's a half a dozen. And um, we gather and we open up the scripture purely to listen to what the scripture may reveal in the kind of a modern practice of an ancient spiritual discipline called Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina simply translates as sacred reading. There is no preparation required to participate in Lectio Divina other than the often tricky task of getting oneself open to whatever the Holy Spirit may nudge onto our awareness as we read the scripture together in that morning. So as we gather, whoever's facilitating for the day generally will read a couple of verses, sometimes from Isaiah, sometimes from an epistle, in an attempt to help us get ourselves open to whatever the Spirit may wish to reveal. Well, for three and a half years now, the scripture that I most often employ to try to help our group get open at 7 a.m. each morning just happens to be today's focal text, Psalm 119. In fact, this particular section of Psalm 119 is the text that I've used for all of these times that we've been together. Let's read this together. I think you'll see it here on the screen. Now, I want a quick note. Um, I have substituted plural pronouns for singular ones in the original text, but go with me on this if you want here. Let's read it. Teach us, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and we will observe it to the end. Give us understanding that we may keep your law and observe it with our whole heart. Lead us in the path of your commandments, for we delight in it. Turn our hearts to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn our eyes from looking at vanities. Give us life in your ways. Is this a familiar text to anybody? Those of you. Last Monday, uh, Barbara Edwards and Dan Chan and I traveled to Guaymaca, Honduras. It's been a full week. It was a scouting trip we took in preparation for our upcoming partnership experience with Emmanuel Orphanage, which is coming up in December. It's not too late if you wish to join us. Now, I've never been to Honduras. It's kind of a common view of the streets. And I hadn't visited an orphanage in about 25 years. And I don't speak Spanish very fluently. So in a lot of ways, this experience of this week was really outside of my familiar rhythms and my life experience. But in an interesting and perhaps providential twist, the sermon text for today, Psalm 119, which I selected weeks ago to be today's sermon text, and became a text that I studied every day this week in Honduras on airplanes back and forth and all the days that I've returned this whole week, studying this text, Psalm 119. So this week, Psalm 119 became something of a, a week-long prayer, where every day I employed it again, but this time in an attempt to get us open to seeing what God may wish to reveal to us about our pending partnership with Hondurans. Again, let's read, lead us in the path of your commandments, for we delight in it. Turn our hearts to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn our eyes from looking at vanities and give us life in your ways. So Psalm 119 has long been orienting me at the start of the day to try to open myself to what the Spirit may want to reveal for the day. And this week, Psalm 119 served every day in a longer game, trying to get us to be open to what it is that God may reveal about what's coming in a few months in the land far away. So today, I'd like to open Psalm 119 together and see what else the psalm might be useful for in helping us um, be shaped and edified. Psalm 119, if you'll open it up in the Bibles near you, it's on page 494, today's little section is. 
And I'll give you a second to turn there, 494. And while you're turning, let me give you just a little bit about the structure and function of Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest of the 150 Hebrew Bible Psalms. Um, in fact, it's the longest chapter in the whole Bible, 176 verses. And um, it's interesting that uh, it's usually considered a wisdom psalm, which, according to one commentator, celebrates God's ways and describes the confidence and peace that humans can gain from obeying them. I want to read that again. This psalm is often described as a wisdom psalm, which celebrates God's ways and describes the confidence and the peace that humans can gain from obeying them. How many of you could use just a little more confidence and a little more peace in your lives? This psalm is interestingly structured. Um, it's a 22 stanza poem you will. And every line of each stanza begins with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew alphabet starts with Aleph and then Bet and then Gemel, Dalet, etc., etc. And each stanza then from one to the next starts with um, a different successive letter. So all the verses one through eight, every line begins with the Hebrew letter Aleph or what we would say A. Second section, second stanza, uh, every line begins with the Hebrew version of B. Now, this has made Psalm 119 kind of the subject of some criticism from serious biblical scholars. They say it's just so repetitive. It's so repetitive um, with every letter, you know, being the same. It's, uh, and it's even a little bit gimmicky, some would say, kind of like when any preacher uses alliteration to postulate their presumably important points. Preacher of Psalm 119. But not only is it grammatically gimmicky in kind of a literary way, they say it, it's also repetitive because it employs the same 10 synonyms in every stanza except a couple. The same 10 synonyms are used, sometimes eight or nine of them in every stanza, which are all synonyms for kind of the same idea, and it's God's ways. Sometimes it's law or laws, or sometimes it's statutes, sometimes it's Torah, sometimes it's commandments, sometimes it's words. But every time it's employed, it's all, always pointing to the thing like, show us your way, O oh God. Show us your ways. Show us your Torah. Show us your law. Show us what you want us to see. And one feature of Psalm 119, which I really appreciate, I think most of the other commentators seem to also, is how this Psalter uh, portrays what I'm going to call the universal human struggle. The struggle between doing what we merely want to do as compared to doing what we might be called to do. Anybody ever notice any tension between those things? It's what I want versus what I might be called toward. That's why we pray this every morning to try to get ourselves open to what more may I be being called to see versus just what is on my agenda in the morning. This struggle is captured pretty well, I think, in verse 36. Let's read it. Turn our hearts to your decrees and not to selfish gain. How many of you have um, felt that contrast inside of you before? Yeah. Is it unfair to say it's a universal human struggle? The contrast between those two things? I don't think so. In fact, can you think of anybody in the scripture who vocalizes that very same dilemma or that same struggle? Yeah, isn't this the plight of the rich young ruler, as we call him? Matthew 19, he comes to Jesus and he says, hey, I want eternal life, everlasting life. And what does Jesus say? Obey the commandments. He says, I do all of that. And yet I lack. And what's he say? He says, so relieve yourself of all your many possessions, give them to the poor, and then follow me. And we find that that person went away grieved. Because grief is always the product when we try to stand in that gap between what we want and what God wants. 
Grief is always the product of trying to navigate that gap and living in that gap between what we merely want and what God may decree. Further, I think of King David, the man after God's own heart. You know what his final prayer was? It was a prayer as his son Solomon was becoming king. And in his final prayer, David seems to vocalize that this universal human struggle has been Israel's perennial challenge the whole time. It never stopped being a problem for Israel. And so David's final prayer, as recorded in the First Chronicles, is, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our ancestors, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. That's at the end of David's reign. I can even fast forward a thousand years. Go to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, after 30 years of faithfully following Jesus, you know what he says about this? I still, I still don't do the things that I know I'm supposed to. I still, I don't do the good I, I want. I, the evil inside me is what I do. Well, not only does this psalm seem to name that struggle, but I think it even gets a little detailed around it. And it might show kind of where some of this comes from, at least part of the time. In verse 37, the Psalter says, let's read it, shall we? Turn our eyes from looking at vanities and give us life in your ways. Does anybody know anything about looking at vanities too much? I'm sorry, I need to check something really quick. Hold on a second. I got a picture. You should see it. Yeah, what could there be any more descriptive term for the way that so many of us spend so much time and energy curating perceptions, especially in the digital world? Could there be a better term to describe them than looking at vanities? I feel like that's a just spot on. <laughs> Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. You see this project that so many millions of people spend enormous amounts of energy trying to curate perceptions. And it's a project which inevitably steals our vitality rather than restoring it or improving it. And so I lean into the Psalter's prayer, save me from just looking at vanities and give us life and aliveness that's according to you. It's a cute picture though, you should see. <laughs> it's pernicious, isn't it? Hmm. Orphanages are not ideal places. But Emmanuel, the one we visited this week, seems to be characterized to me as a place where this great tragedy is getting intersected by immense beauty. And the beauty is winning. It's winning um, both geographically in the landscape you can see. It is really extraordinarily beautiful. But this beauty is also winning ideologically. I saw this plaque in one room. It says, the child born to another woman calls me mommy. The magnitude of that tragedy and the depth of that privilege are not lost on me. The beauty is winning. And maybe not. But in part, I think it's because the ways of life at Emmanuel they are shaped entirely by the ways they understand to be what God would, has always designed for human life to be. They live according to the rhythms and the practices and the principles that they believe God has put as kind of the recipe for delight for all humanity. They live that out starting at 4.15 every single morning when they get started. 
And it seems to me in part that the product of that dedication to the Lord's ways, Torah, precepts, statutes, their dedication to those rhythms end up being exactly what the Psalter is seeking in Psalm 119. When the Psalter prays, give me life in your ways and lead me in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. Now, folks, a lot of my non-Christian friends, I assume, think that religion is kind of a coercive, puritanical, moralistic program that just leads to squishing the life out of people. And so many people, they employ other structures or constructs in order to try to find some sort of meaningful life. I'd like us to take a little two minute drill here and talk to each other about how we find that living a path according to God's commandments leads to delight. And I would love for us to just share quickly our experiences. You can get up and talk to each other. Laura's going to play for us for two minutes. And I'd love for us to just kind of ponder that together. Does it lead to delight or does it mostly lead to us feeling coerced and, and moralistic? So let's talk to each other, shall we? Ready? Go. Hey, do you know there are there is there are smiles and there is laughter in every section of this room right now. <laughs> smiles and laughter, hopefully related to how following God's commandments leads to something like that. Well, um, lest this little dialogue become a purely theoretical or theological thing to think about, I'd like us to think for a minute about how we might employ. Or, or apply this thing in our in our lives this week, yeah? So I have two proposals um, that I want to share about how we might ask for God's ways to actually become our ways, or maybe better, for our ways to change into becoming God's ways, maybe is a better way to say that. And so here are two suggestions. One, I'd like to suggest that we could do this individually, switch the pronouns back to singular uh, first person, uh, I've shared how, you know, every morning, or not every morning, but every morning that I'm part of the Lectio Divina group, I employ this psalm to help orient ourselves toward openness. And I shared this week about how uh, this whole week I employed this psalm every day to try to get us open as a group to how we might be discerning of what God was up to. But here's another um, possible application, a third application individually, you might say, and that is, how many of you wear a Fitbit? I'm new to the Fitbit game. But every hour at 10 minutes before the hour, my Fitbit buzzes and tells me how many steps I need to take in the next 10 minutes in order to accomplish my goal. Yeah, bzz, you have 129 steps left. Bzz, you have 250 steps left. I have that every hour because I never get enough steps, apparently. So this week I took a Fitbit clue about how I might use this song. On Friday morning when it reminded me about 9 o'clock that I hadn't taken enough steps, I thought, wait a minute, I'm going to see. What if I took my phone? And if I took on my calendar and I applied a reminder for every hour to attend to one of the verses of this stanza, one of the verses in this stanza, these eight stanzas. And so as you can see there, I started at nine o'clock, I guess, and every hour I focused on a different one. So instead of just my Fitbit reminding me I need to take some steps, my phone reminded me this is what it looks like. And so at nine o'clock, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. I so long for my heart to be in that place. Do you know what I found? I found it was really interesting how far I had strayed from what I prayed at the top of the hour. Prone to wonder, Lord. Prone to leave the God I love. And I was really struck by how could I get so far away in 50 minutes from this thing? I know I want my heart to be attuned to these things. It was interesting to be reminded all day, but it was also kind of jarring to see just how far we stray. 
So I offer you this as a suggestion. Give it a shot. See if you can employ Psalm 119 just like this, maybe this way, and see what happens in your experience. But here's another application, another proposal, and that is congregationally. You know, we've spent the last two weeks very carefully looking at Paul's exhortation to the church for how to be Christian in a world just like the world we actually live in. And what Paul said about being Christian, Romans chapter 12 is where we look, is that it always, always starts individually with your bodies and the transformation of your mind. It's incarnation and transformation. That's where Christianity begins, but it never stops there. It has always been an expansive application to where it goes from me to then us, and then from us to kind of them. Next slide. We saw this picture and we saw that Christianity is an expansive embodiment until it reaches all humanity, entire societies or species. That's the game that Christ was up to with us. Many of you signed a covenant or a commitment last week that, yeah, for this fall, I'm going to try to employ Paul's exhortation to do just exactly what Paul told the church to do in times just like the times we're in. How do we do this together? So here's my question. Today's launch Sunday for the fall formation season. So what if we took Chestnut Grove's priorities and plans for this fall? And we got on our knees and together, what if we held this up, all of our plans? And we said, God, just help us see it and do it as you would have it done. Just help us to see and respond to what you're asking of us. So we talk a lot about faith and formation and fruitfulness being the three Fs, our priorities. So what if as our faith, in order to practice proclamation and celebration, what if we just prayed the verse here that the Psalter said, confirm to us your servants, your promise, that you so love the whole world that you gave Christ Jesus. And that in so doing, you gave us an opportunity to protect, to practice an unbreakable, never-ending divine human union that we sometimes call eternal life. What if that was our prayer altogether? Confirm your promise to us, O oh God. Or when it comes to our formation undertakings, this never-ending practice of continuing to be transformed in our minds and our bodies, the never-ending project of becoming a disciple. What if we simply said to God, hey, God, give us understanding so that we may keep your law and observe it with our whole hearts. What if we prayed that all together with sincerity? God, give us understanding so that we can be all in with all of our calendars and all of our resources and all of our energies. And it kind of brings up the question for me, do we really want that kind of understanding? We really want the kind of understanding that may require us to change our thinking a bit. Big challenge, isn't it? Well, what if we did that? Or when it comes to all of our fruitfulness efforts, like we have several. We're going to Honduras in December. We're going to re-enlist our tutors to help raise literacy and second graders at Broadus Wood here in just the next month or so, probably. But what if instead of focusing so much on the plans, what if we said together, Lord, just Turn our hearts to your decrees and not to selfish gain. So when I got to make decisions about my time, what if I said, oh, I, I want to do what God wants done and not just what I want to do. Not just what's comfortable or familiar or self-enriching. The American culture right now is firmly committed to helping people maximize their individual success and whatever the project is that they've defined as success. Well, what if we said, that's not our goal, God. As a church, we as Chestnut Grovians, we just want to give ourselves away for the aliveness of the world. And so we ask you to show us what that looks like. And so here are our plans. Here are our hands. Here is our time. What would it look like? Well, I think for us, we might end up looking like this little guy. On Tuesday of this week, Dan and Barbara and I came upon this little fella, about nine years old, I think. He and several others kind of in the same age, they were just mopping the concrete sidewalks. 
which is a daily task, and they were doing it with such zeal and even a bit of joy. It was a task required of the community in order that they might live in healthy, safe kinds of ways. I haven't seen an eight-year-old or nine-year-old mopping the floor very often, so it kind of got my attention. Just part of the school day for these guys. But what it reminded me is when we undertake what the Lord has for us, it's not a burdensome, curmudgeon moralistic, puritanical, rigid, precision-oriented undertaking. It is a way that leads to delight. And I wonder if we, as a congregation, might, in a few months' time, look around and see that our norm is laughter. Our kind of default is postures of smiles and delight because we have embraced what the Psalter suggests that we embrace as a trajectory to be involved in what God's calling us to. That would be my prayer for us, that we might look as delighted as this little guy up here. Yeah, may it be so. Let's pray. God, it seems the world thinks that religion is intended to squeeze the life out of us. Instead, it's according to scripture to squeeze the life into us. God, I thank you that no matter how far we have wandered, that you don't give up on us. That you, you are so committed to infusing us with a kind of new aliveness, that you're willing to die even, that we may be able to receive it. I thank you for your commitment to us. I pray this morning we may be open anew ready to receive the new aliveness that you long to pour into each of us and all of us, that we may be filled with your delight. May it be pleasing to you. May your kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen.